So welcome everybody. We're here to celebrate neurodiverse, neurodivergent voices within UAL for Research Week. And just to make some housekeeping um, arrangements, so your cameras and mics are automatically muted, as you'll see. Um, your, your, um, you can put any questions in the question and answer box as the speakers speak, because we're planning to take questions at the end. Um, as I've explained, the event is being recorded and we have loaded the chat box. So as people are speaking, if you want to make comments, you're really welcome to do that and it will help us pick up on what to feedback about. So um, my name is Lorraine Gammon and I run the Design Against Crime Research Centre at Central St Martins. And I'm delighted tonight to be talking um, on this subject. Um, and to sort of give some background, we, we seek as a group to open up a discussion about neurodiversity within UAL. Um, certainly the diagnosis includes all sorts of things such as dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity in quotes disorder, and autistic spectrum in quotes disorder. It depends how you speak about these things amongst other labels. Um, and certainly in the world, there is a growing recognition and evidence of the extraordinary contribution of neurodiverse people. And it's what we want to talk about tonight in all terrains, including business, as innovators, entrepreneurs, as well as creatives. Um, so speaking tonight, the lineup looks like this. I'm going to talk a bit about my work with PRISON and, and my own experience. Carlotta Allen, who is a UAL L.PhD student, will be joining us to talk about her, her work with Stretch Charity, which also works with prisoners. Shana Tafal, who is a UALMV A student, who's also located at Birkbeck as well as Central St Martins. And um, we'll be talking about neurodiversity in business and a co-production co board. Joseph Aquilina, founder of Neuro Know How and Neurodiversity is a specialist and consultant, and he'll be sharing some of his experiences Piers Roberts, who is a UAL associate lecturer and founder of Designers Block and social entrepreneur, will be sharing some thoughts and views. And Caroline Huntley has kindly joined us to speak about UAL disability services on how UAL students access these services and how it works here, because we have good practice to share and we wanted to talk about that. And at the end, I'll come back um, with some concluding remarks and an invitation for the audience to participate. So why me and why now? Um, so for me, the account by Howard Gardner of multiple intelligences um, raises a lot of questions about abilities we don't know how to accurately measure. And Gardner's work, to say the least, is fringe. It's, it's not a central account. It's not an evidence-based account so far. But for me, it has delivered some good work and has value in explaining some of the co some of the diverse competencies I see in art school and prison and also some of the things I personally have trouble with as a dyspractic I wouldn't call myself body smart since 1999 I've been leading a research center and active in research knowledge exchange and teaching and at UAL I've contributed to all sorts of things that are research based and my work has helped co-create design benchmarks, resources and publications with the Design Against Crime team. I'm not going to talk about them, but here are some of the benchmarks. Um, and here are some of the design resources that share with others, I suppose, how to design against crime. Um, you can find them online if you want to go back and have a look. But the work I'm going to talk about tonight really is how, you know, about how my tea, team has been working in prison. Um, particularly with the Make Right project. Um, Make Right is an eight week course that teaches inmates, um, inmates students creative skills. And we do all the stuff we do at design school, you know, develop personas, storyboard, design prep. And the men in prison who engaged were able, they started with these um, toys and which they made super quickly. And we ended up creating a range of anti-theft bag designs that were sold as a brand for Abel and Carl. If you look at Abel and Carl's website, you can find um, some of those objects there. Um, we've also co-created um, with prisoners um, across the estate. And the whole point is that prisoners are not just, you know, the problem, they're part of the solution. So we've co-facilitated 
um, design workshops at Stamford Hill with staff as well as prisoners to try and generate safer self furniture. And the designs are strong, I'll come back to that. It makes re really clear to me that there's a lot of creative talent in prison. But there are also a number of um, dyslexics in prison, a great number, as, as well as people who suffer from neurodiversity or experience it in a positive way. Um, it's been argued that as many as 60% of art and design students are, are argued to have problems, in quotes, with visual spatial learning styles. I mean, some of our best talent are comes from this. But studies from England, um, Sweden and USA suggest that it's sort of similar in, in the prison population, that, um, you know, in all three countries, there are many neurodiverse in prison, depending on how you measure it. And it's no surprise too that entrepreneurs are found to be disproportionately dyslexic or ND, given, um, I would say, both criminals and creatives have strong entrepreneurial qualities. Um, and so, this has been something that I've known for years and I've been troubled by because I, I'm troubled that so many people end up in prison who could, you know, come to art school. And, you know, it's only recently that the government have acknowledged that half the people entering prison could have some form of neurodivergent condition, including autism, brain injury and learning difficulties. This is from a July 21 report. And this is a big thing because it's, it, I think, will begin to instigate change. And the sort of change I, I want to see is um, the fact that artists and designers are known for seeing things differently. I, I call it sideways thinking. And certainly creative learning techniques seem to work well for, for art designers, artists and designers and other creatives because it reaches part of the brain and prisoners' brains too, that traditional education methods appear to have failed. And I, I think these creative techniques are really important um, because they enable different learning approaches and they've certainly been underestimated um, in the new white paper on what we should do in prison. And so I'm just showing you this chair. This is an important object for me because it was co-designed a few years back with prisoners and staff from the centre. And this chair, you know, solves the problem of having no space in the, in the cell. So what you can do, you can turn it upside down and work at your desk, or you can have a comfy chair because that's what the prisoners wanted. You can also use this chair to exercise. And the point is, is that there's lots of talent in prison that can make a difference. And UAL have good practice in, in providing tools and learning techniques for our neurodiverse students that Caroline at the end will, will talk about. And I, I wanted to share those um, techniques with, with prisoners and certainly the disability label is necessary to access such services. I personally have refused to be labelled dyspraxic or dyslexic despite some suggestions from my colleagues and I, I think what's good about art school is that we have a really strong culture not just of addressing equal rights but looking at an asset rather than deficit approach um, to people's talents and how it is linked to neurodiversity there's certainly strong recognition that people should be treated, you know, appropriately. And I love Martin Buber, I am now rather than the objective idea. For me, is everything. None of us want to be segregated. Thou is with whom I can empathise and dialogue. And for me, empathy is a very important part of the process. But it's more, uh, it's more than just individuals. Um, the, diver the voices of our diverse community of practice hasn't been heard as a collective thing and maybe could be heard louder and beyond UAL and so some of the research questions I have personally is where is UAL's evidence library about the contribution of its neurodiverse community to art design social and commercial practice how can prison learn from and emulate art school because we have good practice to share and how can UAL's neurodiverse community of practice share their hard learned coping strategies with other communities that need their help. And so what I'm going to do is hand over now to our speakers. I've asked for neurodiverse personal journeys, professional learning stories, because lived experience for me is everything. It's at the heart of design research. And again, often offers a sideways approach to starting new conversations that weren't happening. And so tonight we hope to identify some collective strategies and credible messengers who can take the UAL discussion forward. I'm now going to hand over to our next speaker, Carlotta Allen. Over to you, Carlotta. Hello, everybody. Sorry for my late arrival. I was being typically neurodiverse in being very over optimistic as to what I could fit in 
to a day. So I've just actually come from teaching in a prison and it took me ages to um, get here. So I'm going to share my, we haven't had a run through with my presentation, so I'll just check that I can do that. Is that good? Can you see that? Yeah. Yes, thanks, Carla. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> I wasn't hearing anybody. Okay, so my name's Carlotta Allum. I um, am a PhD student with Design Against Crime at Central St. Martins, which I was invited to, and Lorraine is actually my, um, uh, my chief supervisor. Um, but I've been running a charity myself for 18 years now. Um, and that was started because I spent some time in prison. So I'm kind of a perfect crossover of a lot of the things that we've been talking about. And my journey to sort of self-realization and diagnosis um, has sort of really helped me make sense of uh, a lot of chaotic decisions I made in my life. And it's only really sort of may fallen into place in the last couple of years and, and through this sort of diagnosis practice that I've been through, through the college actually, who, who have sort of set it set the wheels in motion. I mean, I'm a practitioner and through my work, it's very practice based and we do workshops and um, going, yeah, so I, I run, started my own charity because I couldn't teach because of my criminal record. 400% more likely to open your own business if you have ADHD. But these were things that I only found out sort of afterwards when I'm reading into it um, after um, all the learning I did. So when I found myself invited to do a PhD at Central St. Martins, I would never have had the nerve to go to such a statement art school, I don't think at 18 or 19. Um, so I, I always felt like, ah, you know, this, 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 there must be some mistake. <laughs> are they sure they've got the right person? Um, you know, should I be here? Um, that, uh, you know, do they really believe what, what I'm going to do is worthwhile? And, you know, I read around the subject and found out that this imposter syndrome is very common. And just in the same way that many prisoners that I work with feel imposters in any kind of education, um, I think coming into my like, academia, especially after a break of uh, quite a long time, I didn't feel like um, I was worthy of the place as many people that would tell me how good you are and that you're the perfect person to be doing the PhD, um, it never quite sinks in and you never quite believe it. And I think my first year was really tough. Um, I, I felt like I kept having to change my questions, repeat myself. I wasn't understanding the language used around um, registration objectives, methodologies. Um, and I, I felt like I was sinking and, you know, it was, I started um, going to the therapy, the free therapy sessions that you get at the college, um, the six, three, three sessions, because um, I felt like I was drowning. I felt out of place and like I, I was drowning. Um, but this, and, and they throw all these things that you can do and all these classes at you. And um, I wasn't sure how many I should be going to. And I have to say, you know, my team of supervisors were extremely supportive and, and actually discouraged me from engaging with all these classes and thinking that you have to sort of attend every class and get completely bogged down in all the things that you have to do. Um, and yeah, I, I felt that it, yeah, I was an imposter and it was, it was, it was too much for me. And, the, and any minute now I was going to be found out and I was going to be kicked off and they said they'd made a terrible mistake <laughs> and that I shouldn't be on the course at all. Um, and so reading around it now, and these are a couple of slides from another person in the college that I think gave to you, Lorraine, um, that this, you know, the university atmosphere uh, does trigger this sort of imposter syndrome and sort of elevate your ADHD, or your anxiety around that. Um, you know, it it's, can be quite competitive. Um, you can feel quite isolated, especially in postgraduate study when you're coming up with your own ideas and own subject and you're sort of leading it yourself. It's, it, it's especially hard and, and, you know, finding people that you like and look up to and role models. Um, and yeah, it's a snobby, unfriendly environment sometimes, you know, when you enter into 
lectures or, or sort of talk to some people. Um, and I think I was surprised at how CSM actually wasn't too much like that. And when I'd done my first degree at King's, I felt completely out of place. And I scraped through with a 2-2 and I didn't really engage with um, university at all. And it's since sort of all this learning I've done since then that I've realised the struggles that I've been through and the sort of self-coping mechanisms that I've put in place before I'd been properly diagnosed. Um, I liked this slide as well from the, from the same place that you, you've, you're on a cycle, you maybe come up with a way to achieve a small target, but you don't take praise very well. So if somebody tells you, yes, that's really good, you don't really hear it. And so you just sort of start that cycle again of feeling like an imposter. Um, you think, yeah, you think you know a lot less than um, what other people know. That's quite a nice pictorial <laughs> of what, what the reality is. And I think it's taken me four years to really sort of own my place in the college and own what I'm doing. And, and um, yeah, I think it's only since really confirmation that I've felt like uh, you know I deserve to be here you know and I'm still still struggle with it um, I, I still struggle with it sometimes um, so I did approach student services and I'll talk a bit about you know my experience of doing that and I didn't really have a problem with you know the label of disabled but I know some undergraduates and I have spoken to undergraduates who do have a problem with approaching disability services because you know it's um, uh, yeah, they don't want to be labelled and they don't want to be part of that group. Um, it was a long um, uh, yeah, process. I got referred to educational psychologist who went through all this, like it's about a three hour sort of testing process. Um, and in, I was also reading about a lot of women because it was in the press quite a lot, how a lot of women were being diagnosed. A lot of um, academic women as well were being diagnosed quite late with ADHD, so um, it, it made me think, and I, I was on the journey looking for um, a proper diagnosis. So I got it, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, this is just the the sort of summary conclusion from my um from my from my testing, from my disability testing, and there it was in black and white, and you know something that I could then take to the services, that I, you know ADHD and dyspraxia, um, and. It, it made sense of a lot of things and it, and it made me, you know, more aware of things that can trigger um, ways of thinking and things to look out for. And, and it made me also um, go to um, a proper psychiatrist and get medication, which has helped a lot as well. And that was through another academic who had recommended that to me. And I think one of the really important things for me was having mentors and people I could talk to who were also ADHD like Joseph who you will hear from um, and and that's all paid for by the college and you know to have the time and the space and the encouragement of someone to keep keep at you who knows that you get distracted and who knows what you're like and I have to say you know Lorraine as my um, director of studies knows that I get distracted and calls me every week and tries to sort of keep me on track with my PhD. Um, so I think everyone knowing, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about it and I've given other little talks about it to undergraduates and, and new graduates, because um, I think it's something that should be talked about and, sh and shared. And also with my work in prisons, um, you know, I talk about it in that context as well. And seeing it, going back to that slide as a positive and there's a reason that I start lots of projects that I'm always having ideas and you know that it, it is a it's a superpower and it's just it's not a way you need a way to control it rather than um, than fight against it um, so some of the things that were recommended to me through um through the disability services were uh, bits of software like um, audio note, note takers, so lots of things that use pictorial sort of ways of collecting notes, mind view and mind mapping. And, you know, they've been really useful um, ways for me to organize myself. And so, you know, they, they give, did offer me a lot of support and I've been very grateful for the way actually I've been treated. 
so yeah it's helped a lot <laughs> and I think in the end um I think that self-awareness that talking to lots of people um is a really sort of yeah it's a really useful way to proceed but I do understand that it's difficult for some students you know it's taken me probably 30 years to get in that position that's it thank you Thank you, Carla. So we're going to hand over now to Shona, who will talk about her experience on the MBA and at Central St Martins. So over to you, Shona. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for the invite to join this today. Um, Lorraine, um, I am having a very dyspractic day. Um, I thought maybe <laughs> that today would not be a good day for me to speak up on being neurodivergent. And then I realised it, it is actually the perfect time because I get to I get to share my lived experience in real time as to how it impacts me. So I'm Shana. I there we go. There's an, a perfect example. Moving the slide and it's not moving. <laughs> Technology at its best. So I'm the founder of Model My City, which is um, an organization and project I set up to bring the UN Sustainable Development Goals to life across Camden. I'm also on the Neurodiversity in Business co-production on the co-production board and have various other roles. And I'm currently a Central St. Martins and Birkbeck MBA student. So this is a snapshot of my neurodivergencies, dyspraxia, ADHD, auditory processing disorder, and sensory processing disorder. And then around it, I created a word cloud of some of the themes uh, around how it presents, and then also some of my strengths and um, various elements that just kind of really sort of help frame who I am as a neurodivergent intersectional individual. And so this is me about to present a snapshot of how it presents. So the reason I have my video off is because I get sensory overload. And this is something I'm trying to model in the workplace because it's assumed that if you don't have your video on, it's rude, you have to explain it. And I'm trying to become more comfortable with not explaining it, but then I also do explain it at times so that people understand and can learn and, and, and appreciate that it's perhaps not, it might not be the best for this to be the norm because it, it puts the burden on the person that has the challenges. I have a disability around speaking and communicating verbally. This is a challenge in my day to day. I can go from being absolutely in sync and in flow and being able to inspire and influence people to being super awkward and bumpy as I am demonstrating now. Um, there is a glitch between my thoughts because of the ADHD, my brain races ahead and being able to verbalize it is really difficult because of the auditory and sensory processing, and sorry, just the processing side of things. It, it can be really, really difficult for me. Um, people have said that often it, they can't tell, but um, I think this is one of those moments where I think it really helps to sort of show that it can be really, really difficult to genuinely form thoughts and being able, being able to verbalize it. And this is something that, um, yeah, that I, I, I'm just trying to help people understand. It's a little bit like um, the wheel, I, I, I liken it to a wheelchair um, analogy. It's an invisible sort of um, disability, but um, with a wheelchair, you know, you wouldn't take a, a ramp away from somebody. Um, you know, they, they need that ramp. And so, you know, some of the challenges and, and the needs and the, that I share sometimes get taken as a preference and not an actual need. And so some of the other ways I experience challenges is with technology. Because I'm dyspraxic, it means that sometimes I find it difficult to type and to kind of use a computer and various other technology. Um, and then also listening can be difficult for me. And so I'm just gonna set the scene a little bit with my starting point, because um, this cartoon actually just sort of shares a, a little snapshot of how I perceive time. So with ADHD, people perceive time, uh, they, they call it time blindness, but I find that um, quite an incorrect term. To me, it feels like time overload, because for me, I can, my starting point is that I can see time from the beginning um, and ahead right to the end of time. So 
in my head, I just have a sense in the background of the entirety of time existing. That makes it really, really difficult to ground myself in the day to day and in the moments. So I have a sense, uh, a, a varied sense of running out of time and then being overwhelmed by time. I've recently been speaking to my academic mentor and we're exploring strategies around how to reframe how I work with time and how I perceive time and looking at this idea of scarcity of time. And this is where ADH people are really, really great at deadlines and crises because once they, when they're under pressure and have that scarcity of time, they excel and do some absolutely out, out of the box magical things. So this is another snapshot that I wanted to share and one that I have not seen anybody um, showcase or describe before, but th this is kind of my sense of how it feels. So um, I live at extremes. I feel as if I go from one extreme to the other, whereas most people are sort of generally quite in the, in the middle with many of the talents and traits and strengths and weaknesses. And so in the workplace, I can go from being celebrated to demonized. When I speak, I can feel I can come across as warm and then sometimes I'll be awkward. Um, I can be fast in the way that I do things, but then in other areas I can be slow. I need to do it in my own time. I, because of the dyspraxia, can be super clumsy, have a very a day full of glitches and be very, very clumsy. Um, but then I also have Olympic level reactions where something will happen and I'll just instantly react and the frustrating thing is I have no idea when it's going to happen and the one thing that I do know is that it's consistently inconsistent and that's the frustration and, and the challenge with being dyspraxic. Um, my neurodivergency also leaves me to be sensation seeking and sensation avoiding and I have hyper focus and um, also um, I'll have days where my attention is on everything at the time so again the term ADHD attention deficit disorder um, I feel is um, incorrect because it's more that we have attention on everything and it can be really, really hard to know how to prioritize and where to um, direct that attention. And so we need help and strategies with that. And that's where medication and counseling can come in helpful. So this is a slide that I've pulled from um, Genius Within who have created it to show that um, neurodivergent people have a spiky profile. And what that means is that we, have, we excel in some areas and have weaknesses in other areas. The middle line is where most people tend to be, just, just sort of, you know, just there's little variation. And with neurodivergent people, there are extreme, quite extreme um, peaks and yeah, dips where the lower part is the challenges and the higher part is where they excel at. One of the reasons I wanted to share this is because one of the things that I'm researching and investigating is the idea of how, well, the, the problem of how workplaces aren't designed for us. And so in the workplace, you have your job description and you would be in, expected to deliver everything consistently all of the time. That doesn't work for me in, as a neurodivergent. There are some areas of the job where I absolutely excel and it would be really great to be able to create roles where I can actually do more of that and less of the weaker side of things. But that doesn't really seem to exist at the moment. And that's something that I'm sort of working towards um, with various organizations and neurodivergent people to kind of consider and explore and research. The good side about it is that I do think big. I'm an outlier, um, intuitive, rebellious, don't follow convention. Um, I, I tend to have lots of spinning plates, doing lots of things all at the same time. Um, I live in the world of complexity and um, just work right across outside of my job description. And to me, that's just a, a box and a, a category, whereas I genuinely just experience the world as everything interconnected as a systems thinker. And so that can be really, really difficult. Um, so I genuinely perceive and react to the world in a different way. And I speak up about these things, even though it's genuinely a challenge for me to talk and to verbalize because I want to role model that people can present, be a leader, you know, uh, join panels and um, share from their lived experience because we need to hear from all diverse voices and different perspectives because otherwise how can we create the truly inclusive spaces that we need? 
Exactly. Thank you, Shana. That was wonderful. We're now going to hand over to Joseph and Polina, who will talk about his practice. Over to you, Joseph. Thank you. Can't hear you, Joe. I just realised, there you go. It should be all right. Can you see that presentation all right? All right. Yes, we okay. can see it. Thank you. Okay. So I'm presenting an idea of, of neurodiversity paradigm shift is, is needed pretty much. Um, so I'll just explain a bit about myself. Um, I'm a neurodiversity specialist. I have neurodivergent labels of dyslexia and ADHD in, in, in that order. I work as an ADHD coach. I'm a National Autistic Society trained mentor, dyslexia and dyspraxia specialist, working at all levels of education from GCSE up to PhD level. Um, and uh, I, one of the things I wanna highlight about that with education is uh, I still don't have a GCSE in English and maths after um, we taking it for three times. And one of the reasons I'm highlighting that is because our current government thinks it's a good idea that um, if you don't uh, have a GCSE in English and maths, then you can't. Um, progress to get uh, student financing and funding to do a degree and if that was the case when I was younger then I wouldn't have helped hundreds of people I work with get two ones and above um, but both of my parents um, came from working class backgrounds illiterate Maltese immigrants after the second world war they sort of had nothing to do over there because it was raised to the ground and they moved to Brixton and then I was born I grew up in Brixton in the 1980s and uh, because of not having GCSEs, English and maths, I had two cho choices. It was either crime or art, and I chose art. Um, and because of that, I won a scholarship to um, study at Chelsea College of Art, where um, from Laura Ashley Foundation, the Walcott Foundation, they paid for my fees, they paid for my materials and my travel expenses. I was then offered a place at um, Chelsea College of Art to do my BA, which I turned down because I wanted to do life drawing because I thought if Da Vinci was who was dyslexic and weird and I should uh, be able to do live drawing as well because it's just as valuable but I was given offered a place at Wimbledon College of Art where I graduated and um, but prior to my graduation I was going to leave halfway through because I couldn't deal with all the academic stuff but it was pointed out that I was probably dyslexic and I had my diagnosis at, at 21. After graduating in, in 99 I was kind of a bit sort of stuck with what I was going to do with a degree in fine art uh, so I worked as a session musician and still do work as a session musician and re recording artists doing festivals around the UK. And I was working um, with uh, the youth offending team, organising and facilitating music and art workshops and identity workshops as a key worker in Lambeth, Peckham, Croydon and, and working with refugees as well. And at the same time as doing that, I was also working with Camilla batman Gillage, who started a kids company working with young people in, in Peckham and East, East London. Um, after there was no funding from, uh, after the, the pretty much the, the Iraq, Iraq war, there was no funding in the arts. I was kind of stuck with what I was going to do. Um, so I decided to, um, to uh, become a, a dyslexia specialist because the majority of people I work, was working with were, were either dyslexic or dyspraxic or ADHD and everyone thought they were weird, but I didn't think they were weird. I thought they were just like me. So I thought, well, I might as well help these people out. Um, during my postgraduate diploma, um, that's when I found out I had a diagnosis of ADHD, ironically, <laughs> um, in my mid thirties during my uh, the, co the course to actually diagnose um, dyslexia and dyspraxia. During that time, I then was invited to join the advisory committee of the United Kingdom Adult ADHD Network. And um, part of that role, I instigated change for diagnostic criteria in higher education. So people can get a screening at least for um, application for disabled student allowance for ADHD because prior to that it, you had to have a medical diagnosis and that had like a waiting list of about two and a half years. Um, I'm also researching into the links between neurodivergence and trauma, one of the things I'm interested in at the moment. But this next slide here is a, a collage of people who have either been outed as being neurodivergent or people who've outed themselves as being neurodivergent. The person I'd like to highlight there is, is Sigmund Freud in the middle next to Steve Jobs, because um, uh, he, he was highlighted by some psychiatrists as believing that he was ADHD because of his links between things and his, his visionary ideas and imagination that led to the birth of psychology and psychoanalysis and psychiatry. 
Um, he also was a cocaine addict, which is a stimulant, similar sort of drug to what is given to kids, which is Ritalin, which is a stimulant, um, except, you know, it's not addictive. Um, another person I'd like to highlight is Muhammad Ali, who's above um, Will Smith, because that's a piece of art by um, Andy Warhol, who uh, is suspected to have been on the autistic spectrum. And Muhammad Ali um, explained to himself, but it's disclosed himself that uh, he was um, dyslexic to, in some, some interview or something, or something disclosed that he thought he was dyslexic. This slide here is, was originally created by Mary Colley. She started a charity called DANDA, which is the, diverse, the Developmental Adult Neurodiversity Association. She unfortunately died, she died. But this is something that we worked on to, um, to highlight the, um, the difficulties that exist and, and that overlap with neurodivergent labels. And, and that was highlighting the difficulties. And I like to highlight the actual strengths in this slide and how they overlap as well. Um, and that kind of leads to the, the the difficulty that we have at the moment, which is a pathological view of um, a pathological uh, paradigm. Um, the pathological, uh, if I could say it, paradigm was um, originally suggested by Nick Walker. Um, and society basically celebrates neurodiversity, but it still focuses on the problems neurodivergence have rather than the problem that exists due to industrialized societal structures. An example I have here is um, Richard Dawkins. He's a British evolutionary biologist who author of The Selfish Gene and the God Delusion, who's a, a professor for public understanding of science at, at, in the University of Oxford. And uh, he's the archetypal success of academia and, and industrialized mechanistic thinking. He describes humans as being lumbering robots. And we are survival machines, robot vehicles, blundly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. But you can imagine that he's good at writing essays, reading books, sitting in exams, being on time for, um, for appointments, waiting in queues in Sainsbury's patiently, reading a map, uh, applying, for applying for funding for his research and just generally fitting in. But if you go to uh, Aboriginal Australia and you have a tribal leader there, um, one of the last cultures to be industrialised by, by the white man, um, they never had... Um, text because text is technology they use pictograms to represent their ideas and put their ideas forward and document them they never had maps they used song lines which was a combination of melody rhythm and rhyme to to document their history and to um pass that information to the ancestral history to their to their offspring um they wouldn't need to go to sainsbury's because uh, they wouldn't have a refrigerator they would learn they'd know how to hunt and gather they wouldn't buy bottles of evian because they'd know where to find water they wouldn't need to worry about time as such in the, in the linear concept that we have of time because it's as long as you get up the sun comes up you avoid the midday sun and then you go to sleep and spend time in dream time but that's was completely changed when when it was industrialized and western civilization went over there and become criminals and, and, and addicts unfortunately but if you swap those two people round, they're both disabled, is the point. I, don't, I disapprove of the language that's used. Autism spectrum these days, which is great, is less of a disorder. But we have dyslexia problems with words, dyspraxia problems with motor coordination. <coughs> and you have attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. I always think, why don't you just chuck in disaster as well? And there's many other uh, deficit words. Um, but I like attention difference hyperdrive. Kind of echoes similar to what, what Shana was saying earlier. And this, this language and view is, is also something that it, people take for um, just, just using it in, in, a, in a sort of simplistic way. Thomas Edison, I'm not a big fa fan of Thomas Edison because he, he stole a lot of ideas, but he was sent home from school um, uh, because he was unteachable. He kept asking too many questions, kept, wouldn't sit still. And uh, Kathleen Burke, who's a professor at University College London, described him on In Our Time on Radio 4 um, as having a mind like a fly. But for me, a fly flies on poo, which is not very useful and it's not very nice. I like, a bit like Muhammad Ali, like to be described as having a mind like a bee, going from one flower to another, collecting pollen to do something creative. And the reason why I'm more likely to jump from one thing to another is because I'm not a linear thinker, I'm a divergent thinker. Society is, uh, the majority of people are more likely to be convergent linear thinkers. And society dictates that you have to do things in a straight line. <clears throat> Time as we know it 
in this dimension is linear, but Einstein would probably argue differently that it isn't linear. Um, but I make, I'm more likely to make links between things and see things holistically than people who are linear and come up with new and interesting ideas and have lots of creativity, which is what we've already discussed and celebrate. Um, but part of that difficulty is due to executive function difficulties <clears throat> that people who are neuro neurodiversity or neurodivergent label who have neurodivergent labels will have executive function difficulties. And um, uh, Thomas Edison explained this in it where he said uh, to invent you need a good imagination and a pile of junk and Einstein was known saying if a cluttered desk is the sign of a cluttered mind of what then is an empty desk a sign and that desk underneath his picture is actually a picture of his desk and to the left we've got Francis Bacon not that I'm comparing myself to Francis Bacon but he's a genius but that's exactly what my studio is like when I was doing my undergraduate I think that the, the shift that we need is to look at um, neurodiversity as permaculture and and looking at the four out of the the 12 principles of permaculture and creating a permanent culture because it's still not there yet um, we need to integrate and not so se segregate um, and th the idea of, of disability having more more of an idea of, of neurodiverse divergent or neurodiversity sort of groups would, would be more useful focusing on, on and value valuing the the marginal and creatively use and, and respond to change now i myself like the idea of comparing myself to to a fly garrick mushroom because they're seen as being a bit weird and a bit strange and no one everyone thinks they're a bit poisonous and, and a bit dangerous but um they they have mycorrhizal relationships with the trees so they commune they basically exchange carbon with, with the trees and, and and they grow next to fir trees and, and beech trees and that whole connection is what leads to, to the beauty and, and leading to the fruit that can be very useful for everyone. So that's why I like the idea of, of, of permaculture as a, as a permanent culture for, to, to allow for neurodiversity to flourish. What is needed still? Well, loads um, in, in all institutions that I've worked with, whether it's Imperial College, whether it's, it's Kingston, whatever, the whole academic system and society is still needs a lot of changing and open-mindedness going on it, in particular people with adhd need psychosocial education they need understanding what the, the actual um difficulty is and same with dys dyspraxia and other other labels understanding what it is and how you fit in and how you think which is met metacognition understanding how you learn and perceive things they need relevant tutoring on assistive technology in the right way showing appropriate skills academic skills and in, in the workplace uh, with their feedback to, to so they know whether it actually works and whether they feel that it actually works rather than just given something then say later on and that needs to be feedback into the actual employer because maybe the employer just needs to change the way they do things just just needs to be at the end of the day people are employed for their strengths and not their weaknesses and focus on their strengths one thing that that i um, did was a visual reading course which in, basically is a technique that improves reading comprehension and speed and my reading ability went from being in the bottom two percent to the better than 71 percent of the population and that's something that people can access through disabled student allowance that's me so if you want to find out it's neuronowhow.com the screen is on there yeah they are thank you joe now we're going to hand over to piers roberts thank you cool Piers, I think you're muted. Unmute yourself. There we go. I'm muted. Uh, okay. So let me just get to start. Wow, that's good. Good start. Um, hello, I'm Piers Roberts, and I am a tutor on the Material Futures MA. I have a diagnosis of autism, and I'm clearly ADHD as well. They rather like some of our other speakers, I think of myself as a non-linear thinker, a pattern thinker. I'm a creative entrepreneur who in 1998 started developing design festivals as a way of celebrating what I saw as this extraordinary creative talent that was emerging at the time across Europe and wanting to put shows on that would communicate that to wider audiences. And there didn't seem to be anything there that really excited me or provided for that. 
and I think in many ways I'm showing a sort of clear autistic trait, which is to be pioneering, to be creative, and to be able to handle vastly complex situations and do it very well. So they kind of look a bit like this, and we can see how we're going. And over the time, I very much sort of helped to change the way people thought about creative festivals, creativity and entrepreneurship. I'd be on the front cover of Icon magazine, interviewing, flying around the world, in some ways a sort of super cool fella. But on the inside, I was sort of falling apart. And a lot of that was to do with the fact I was having genuine difficulties in being able to negotiate the types of relationships that I needed to form with clients, with funding bodies, with the like, in order to be able to develop the opportunities for the business. So I created this world and then I couldn't survive within the world that I created once it became commonplace and normal. So I had the two things happening. In the words of sort of double W.B. Yeats, after having sort of tried so very hard to survive in this world and realised that I couldn't, in the words of Yeats, it was like, things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. The world had moved on since I started. Design festivals had become commonplace and I was no longer needed as a pioneer. I was sort of exhausted and confused and not really sure where my space existed. The financial crisis had reduced the appetite for the type of risky shows that needed my skill set and mindset to be able to deal with. And on the other hand, I had the birth of my son, which was this wonderful sense of new priorities and new hope and the thought of there were other things that I wanted to give my time and space to. And at the same time, I was beginning to hear about this word autism and thinking that sounds a little bit like me and maybe I should find out what's going on in my head because how can I carry on living with this conflict between extraordinary ability and the desire to basically crash? So it caught to the end in 2016, designer's block. I moved into my own sort of personal lockdown, I'd say. Well, I really felt the need to focus on my own mental well-being, my sense of self, being a dad and considering what I needed in the home, what I needed around me in order for me to feel good in myself. And then to start asking who I am, what really matters and where best might I contribute. Part of that was understanding more about neurodiversity and linking with other people who were like me. I found a great deal of solace within that and also beginning to see what an extraordinary contribution was coming from this community that were very often facing extraordinary challenges to be heard or to survive. I still believe very much in the importance of ideas, creative thinking, and the need for positive change. And I can do that through teaching, giving back, gaining from the exchange with my students, and also through consulting where my strap line is to help people to do things better but more fundamentally to do better things. Now there's this wonderful woman called Catherine May who I came across recently and this quote says a lot to me about the need for us to understand and respect who we are, to ask for what we need and not apologize for it, and to feel comfortable in our own skin. So I will read it if you haven't already. The Maori have recently developed a new set of words to adapt their lexicon for the 21st century. Autism is taki watanga, meaning in your own space and time. I find something in this definition that I've been craving all my life, the restless urge to live in the time and space that I was born to perceive, rather than to fit badly into the one that suits everyone else. And we're seeing neurodiversity beginning to be acknowledged in the workplace and with, are we seeing changes for the better? I think we definitely are. To a certain extent, this is being driven by the legal responsibility to put in place reasonable adjustments for any employee. It's also because in the workplace, people are, and companies are finding this extraordinary talent within that workspace. And very often what's happening is that neurodivergent people are simply taking upon themselves to do their own thing. It's simpler than having to try to explain it. You do it yourself, but you find your own way to look after yourself. There are increasingly now examples and references to neurodivergence as an advantage. 
The reason why people like Ernst and Young have a center of excellence for neurodiversity is because they can see that by incorporating people with diverse skill sets and mindsets, companies earn more money. They develop better businesses. Neurodiversity in business is due to launch next week with about 100 different companies, all of whom have signed up to this aspiration to do business with neurodivergent people better. There are communities like the Future is ND, founded by Lucy Hobbs, or we have Charlotte Valeur's Institute of Neurodiversity, where we're beginning to create spaces where we can talk about ourselves with ourselves, to ourselves, instead of having people talk about us and talk down to us and look at our faults. And Diversity Lab is a new consultancy I'm part of, which has been set up by other people with extraordinary abilities, both Lucy and Charlotte were also there, who feel that we can offer something extraordinary to clients through the fact that we think, feel, and see things differently. In due course, a diverse workplace will unquestionably mean integrating visual thinkers, pattern thinkers, data thinkers, linear, non-linear thinkers. And we can have exponentially expanded ways of dealing with the challenges and coming up with solutions. Meanwhile, if we're looking in the educational sphere, then we're saying, firstly, we need to acknowledge that it exists. And we know that it runs all the way through UAL, probably more than many other places, but it's clearly there. It wasn't acknowledged when I was growing up. I think we need to respect that it has often been tough for people who we say, you know, if the child doesn't fit the system, do you change the child or the system? Clearly, we need to change the system, but we're always forcing the blame on the child. And that continues through into higher education. We should be appreciating the hopeful things that are emerging, whether it's in respecting the fact this exists or whether it's developing ways of providing good service. But there's clearly real genuine promise for an amazing future. And in this, it very much reminds me of the time in the early days around design where we were spotting something extraordinary. Nobody else seemed to have noticed it. And we said, look, this is extraordinary. We've still got a long way to develop the right type of support that we need. But with people like Susan Issa, with whom I've worked, we can be recognizing that the, the people we are designing these changes for are the people who will change the future. I passionately believe that we need neurodivergent thinkers in order to help us solve the complex challenges we face. So just to sum up, in a way, neurodiversity at UAL and the next steps for me, I never really thought I'd be a neurodiversity champion. I thought others would be better at it, but I do think it's important to show my face when for many people telling their employers that they are neurodivergent is something they regret. That's something that we want to see change. So we want to follow up on these discussions with talking to neuro and with neurodivergent students and staff to learn more about your experiences and to co-curate some useful talks about where are we going? What do you want? Let's see how we can move this on. We want to engage and exchange with the wider world on positive aspects of neurodiversity and to consider its relevance at UAL. And finally, if I might say, out of my own experiences, there are things that I want to offer about how we support creative entrepreneurship, things that come from my very special perspectives with patterns and relationships and things of that sort. And I want to find a way to introduce such original teaching and learning approaches to suit all students at UAL. Thank you very much for listening. And here are some links, if you like, to some of the organisations that I was referencing earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Piers. I, I, I found that actually really inspiring. 20% of our students at UAL actually start up their own businesses, their startups, you know, social companies. And so I think you're addressing a, a, you know, a very important account. I'd now like to hand over to Caroline Huntley, who will talk about um, you know, what we do at UEL to help our students. And um, I, I really wanted her to speak because actually we often speak as individuals, not as groups. And I think it's really interesting to hear the process. So after Caroline's spoken, um, then we'll open up the discussion to you. But thank you. So over to you, Caroline.
Thank you. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to share any sort of presentation. And that's partly because I wanted to pick up on some of what some of our speakers were saying today. And it's great to hear about people's personal journeys and experiences at UAL as, as students and indeed um, as members of staff as well. So the disability service at UAL is for students across the colleges. So any student at any level, um, so from the foundation students up to the PhD students, everybody can access our service at any time on their journey. So it doesn't have to be when they first join. Uh, actually, it can be right up to the time of their final assessment, if that's what they like. We have three sort of guiding principles, and I think I'd talk through those, which might help to kind of understand the way we work. So we work with the uh, Equality Act definition of disability, which is uh, a, a, a condition or um, health, it can be a long-term health condition. So I'm talking more broadly about a disability beyond neurodiversity here. Um, specific learning differences is how we refer to quite a lot of uh, people who identify as neurodiverse. Um, so it might be a specific learning difference, uh, could be a long term health condition and or a sensory or, or other you know, sort of impairment. And we uh, the, if so, if somebody has something like that, that has a, a day to day impact, an impact on their day to day life. And when you're studying, that is your day to day life. So anything that impacts your studies sort of works, you know, for for us in terms of if we need to define um, or if a student wants to define or identify themselves to us and uh, has a, a, is long term. So long term in the Equality Act terms means has lasted or is likely to last for 12 months or more. That's one of our principles. The other is a social model of disability. And it's quite interesting what Piers said uh, about um, whether you put the uh, emphasis on the, well, he's a child, but when you, you think of it as, as a student or whether you uh, lodge the kind of uh, adjustment into the environment. And the social model says that the environment needs to be altered so that that person is no longer disabled. So the word disabled comes from the social model and you are disabled by your environment. It's not a label that means that is saying anything about you. It's saying that the environment you are in disables you. Um, and for many people who identify as having specific learning differences, it is the environment of um, education and the way that things are structured in learning that may you know, disable individuals in that situation. And the third principle is inclusive practice. We work across the university with all teams in all parts of the university to uh, identify and put in place inclusive practice, which means that people don't have to come and tell us that they are disabled. Some will, and many will still need, you know, those individual adjustments, but it will work for people who don't want to or you know, for many people who then don't need to. Uh, so inclusive practices might be simple things like making sure information is available in advance of, of taught sessions, um, making sure that there are breaks, um, you know, things like that are constitute, uh, go towards inclusive practice. So when a student comes to us and um, they identify that they may have uh, a specific learning difference, they may not know that that's what they're telling us. They may say we're struggling with things. It's hard to uh, work within the environment that is here. I would like to find out more about myself and the journey that the participants this evening have been on uh, might well incorporate uh, an assessment. We offer any student who comes forward to us uh, a, a screening and then an assessment without any charge to that student. So whilst many universities will either 
um, do it on uh, on a means tested basis or perhaps um, will have a fixed charge for all students. We don't. Uh, we recognise that we have many students who have a specific learning difference on neurodivergent. Uh, we have many autistic students and many more than we uh, you know, were aware of in the past. And um, they will uh, want to, you know, find out about this. And it's in, in the arts environment, that's quite a high percentage, around about 17% of our students currently, just to give you a, a figure. And so we offer an assessment. And after that assessment, we will meet with each student and talk through adjustments and support. So adjustments might be things like having more time for um, uh, assessments for hand-ins. We do very few exams at uh, University of the Arts London. We have more assessments if it is exams that can can be arranged as well so that's the most common adjustment but we'll talk through if there are other adjustments people need and the online environment that we've been working with and we still are working with and will continue to do so uh, offers us the opportunity to look at different sorts of adjustments for that environment as well so we uh, go to together with the student, produce something called an individual support uh, agreement. A support, we've already heard about mentoring, uh, which is a one-to-one -one support mechanism. And we also have specialist study skills support, which is uh, also one-to-one uh, -one and both support learning and learning techniques and you know find out w where people's individual weaknesses are, as we talked about the um, spiky profile earlier, and that's significant um, because, you know, students will have different weaknesses. Each student will be different. We don't offer anything that's a package based on any sort of diagnostic information. It is very much individually tailored, both support and adjustments. And finally, we help students to access funding. So uh, Joseph made a reference right at the end uh, of his talk up to disabled students allowance. It's a government grant and um, students can access all the support, which includes assistive technology, which has been mentioned earlier as well, and also those types of support and funding those things. Uh, just one more thing about the university. We offer uh, staff. We have a, a disabled neurodiverse staff network and um, any staff can be part of that. And uh, we, we also have a, a disabled and neurodiversity champion within the university. It covers students and staff and, um, and, and you know, we work with them on policy as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. That was really helpful. I hope um, it might make some of you understand the differences between some organisations. I'd love to see prison have such a uh, offer to the student, what I call the students in education there. I now want to open up to the audience, but before I do that, I wanted to briefly talk about the call. You know, so Caroline talked about the, the, the community of practice that already exists. We're hoping to amplify that. To, to form a broader university practice, you're invited to join us outside or inside the college because it's very important that we have different perspectives. If you're interested in joining us, you'll see a poll on the stream. Um, please, please add your name. If you think you can contribute to a further meeting online or help us co-create a series of lunchtime talks, please join us. If you're able to identify relevant research to inform best practice, um, for teaching and research engagement with publics, please, please share with us. And um, certainly um, we want to come together to celebrate neurodiversity and its lived experience. But I, you know, it's really important as a researcher, I don't really want to over or estimate abilities. And we're talking, you know, colloquially at times, and I am very aware of cognitive bias. A lot of our researchers tend to underestimate their abilities or overestimate them. And so we need to work in multidisciplinary teams. 
also to better understand who is neurotypical. You know, Joseph and Piers talked about others that we can work with and this linear and neurodivergent approaches or divergent approaches. And certainly it's important to really be very specific. So underpinning this discussion is really a recognition that we're unique. The University of the Arts have the biggest cohort of artists and designers in Europe and in Britain. And like many of us have developed our own coping mechanisms just to get by. We don't always talk about it. So, you know, it's obviously to be, be, di you know, be given a label, you have to work as an individual, but it's important to work collectively. And there will be those who don't want to be labeled or to disclose, and that's fine. But those of you who do want to engage in a broader discussion for a new time, which is now, over to you. So over to our audience, any questions, I'd be delighted to hear them. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm going to go now to the Q&A um, questions, if there are any to hear. Sorry, I'm having problems accessing. One moment. Right, so Can I just say thank you to Carmen for um, putting a link in about assistive technology specifically? And yes, we Certainly. do cover that as well. Thanks. Certainly. Thank, thank you too. Um, are there any questions that um, the question that comes up for me is is how to understand and um, implement um, a research discussion? Um, because there are lots of assumptions, and it's important to to open things broadly. So are there any questions that we can respond to? Joseph, do you have a question that you'd like to raise? You're on mute. Um, yeah, sort of. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, like, what, when if um, if students aren't aren't happy with their the support that they get, where, where what happens? Do they get are they able to go somewhere else? Like, it is because I know that with um, a lot of um, uh, unis, they get to um, to choose where their supplier is from and stuff like that. So it's, it's just interesting if, whether that if that's ever something that is is discussed in different universities at all as well. So, um, sounds like a question for me, Joseph. Um, so if a student want, needs to change their supplier, if they are a student who receives disabled students allowance, uh, they would go back to the person who's done, carried out their needs assessment. That's an independent assessment that all students have. And um, yes, of course, they can go back and, and state that they're not happy. Uh, with the the provision I get, not all students who come to the university are um, given to us to provide the support. So there are a lot of providers out there, as I'm sure you know. And uh, yeah, of course, yeah. There, there may be, you know, we we, ha we uh, are aware of quite a lot that our students um, access. And if so, if the student isn't working with us and is unhappy um, we we can support them to find a different supplier. Caroline there are some other questions for you so um, one of our, our, yeah, our so, has asked how, to, how do we support mature students who may not have been supported in early education? Yes yeah, so uh, we would tailor the package of support so again we would look at everybody as an individual and so there isn't a sort of specific pathway for mature students but when a student accesses their support they will um, uh, talk through the things that impact on their study and one of those things might be um, not having had the experience of, of study before um, and so those would be addressed through the individual uh, support those things. Okay well there are two other questions that have come in and again they're addressed to you so one of them is about um, the sort of staff who find out later that they are neurodivergent, probably from engaging with their students. And so do we, do we help them? And also, 
if the support package we apply, uh, we create for students arrives so late, like what happens to the student who's unable to access the full content of the course? Yes, yeah, so um, staff question first. So our HR team, we also offer staff assessments um, free of charge and that is accessed through uh, the university's HR service. And yes, it does happen a lot. And absolutely, that is the scenario quite often. Um, I personally work with a bunch of students, my student caseload, are also members of staff so they're doing internal courses and um, we 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 arrange whilst they're students stu assessments on that basis but but HR can arrange um, for staff who are not students as well so yes that's that's possible so what happens when students get their support so late um, I yeah, I mean, we can only do as much as uh, we can and we'll do our best to put in as much support as possible if uh, the support arrives late. Often that happens because I know students do hold hold back a little bit sometimes on, you know, they think that there is quite often this dialogue that we have with students where they say, do you know, I thought I'd be all right. I thought I'd be able to get through. I had a feeling that I might be um, have a specific learning difference um, or autism whatever and but I'm, I was holding on and then it got to a point it got too much and then they will come to us we do have a cutoff point so we don't assess final year students after the beginning or the, the sort of end of September simply because that does not leave enough time for support so um, we really go big on trying to encourage students to come to us before then and we do a specific campaign for students uh, particularly um, BA students in their third term of their second year um, because they are about to undertake a dissertation in most cases and that may be the, the the catalyst for finding out that support would be helpful so we really push that then to try and get students through. Thank you Caroline that's really helpful. Joe. there's a question for you so basically um, people are asking um, about the facts so what percentage of the population do we define as neurotypical um, what does neurotypical look like, in fact? Is that to me? Yes. What does, what does neurotypical look like? Yeah, so what percentage and what does it look like? Well, I think, um, based on, on the statistics of ADHD, it's apparent, apparently one in, um, I think, no, it's 8% eight, 8 of the population are meant to uh, have a fit an ADHD diagnosis and that's that's people who have have a diagnosis so a lot of, so what it looks like um I mean that's if 50 percent like you say it's 50 percent of prisoners are, are meant to be dyslexic then what are the other 50 percent are they ADHD and, and, and dyspraxia it's, it's, it's not just no so it's it's like so what I see is that yeah. what happens and this is very subjective account but I work yeah, with yeah. new clients too so I see that the exclusion units are full of kids who yeah. don't like teachers and don't like school and I think yeah, I was yeah. one right and yeah, so yeah. basically they are rebellious and yeah. they often get in with the wrong crowd you know and so if you don't yeah. have a middle class parent who can help yeah. you yeah. um but I think the question is really about the national statistics and I, I think it's an important question because like most people I know, and I, you know, I, I've been a, I'm, I'm a CSM lifer. I've been here for 30 years, right? So most people I know are, I don't, who is typical? So tell me who is typical. Yeah. You know, I've asked yeah. my admin support and I'm, I'm not sure she's, she's an artist. I'm not sure she's typical. So like, like what is neurotypical there? Yeah. So that's the question. Um, <laughs> well, the, the the people are the people I work with in, in the workplace. A lot of them have jobs that aren't creative, and they've had to get a job, and so they they struggle with a lot of the jobs that they they they've just put their they they've got into because they've got no other choice. 
um, and a lot of them haven't been diagnosed, um, especially with ADHD, because ADHD in the UK is is difficult to get a diagnosis with because they because of it linked with medication and it, and unlike in America they hand out medication like like it's sweeties in the UK they're a bit more cautious which is fair enough because you're dealing with a stimulant medication and doesn't always work well for people um, so with ADHD in particular is 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 it's difficult to diagnose because when they're young ideally because anyone who's jumping about and running around that's just well that's just a child like a lot of kids that I was working with when I was in the youth offending team the, the majority of the people were there I just everyone thought they were weird and I didn't think they were weird they were just they were just like me so it, it it's it's um it, I don't think it's possible to put a number on it because the accessing a diagnosis you do need money so yeah. to, to have a, a dyslexia diagnosis, you, you know, it was called middle class um, syndrome, middle class child syndrome or whatever it's called, because you had well, to like, have I the money that, to get a diagnosis. That what you're saying is like raising lots of questions for me about the need for more robust research. And, you oh, know, yeah. University of the Arts, we have a particular cohort. I, I think that we have a responsibility, a social responsibility to yeah, develop yeah. a um evidence library actually yeah. you know, the national criminal justice association has an evidence yeah. library about what happens in prison and about how art works differently and that for me you know so to answer the person who asked the question what are the percentages like it depends who you ask they're contested and yeah. actually you know my experience is is that i didn't believe actually having written a number of books and having you know, got through the education system that I might be neurodiverse, but it's very obvious to everybody else that I am <laughs> wonky, right? And that's yeah, yeah. something I'm not ashamed of, but I haven't chosen to go the disability route because I don't like labels and I resent that. Yeah. So the other yeah. questions we're being asked really is um, about, I suppose, I, maybe Piers can answer this question. Why is it you think that you know, people like us have changed Hackney, for example. Would you like to talk a little bit more about that? Because you, you mentioned it briefly. Yeah, I did mention it. I once raised it with the mayor of Hackney and I said, to what extent has um, Hackney transformed from the poorest borough in the UK to one of the coolest places on the planet through initiatives developed by neurodivergent entrepreneurs? The point is, if we don't notice that this is going on, if we don't measure it, then how do we then turn around and say, well, for the revitalization of Middlesbrough or Birmingham, where have you, we should be looking at how we attract and support these people. But I've discovered just consistently that so many of the most exciting change makers are neurodivergent. And there's a lot to back that up. There's statistics that say also 50% of the wealth generated in Silicon Valley has come from founders who are autistic. But also slightly to sort of come on your sort of neurotypical neurodivergent thing. There's this sort of wonderful phrase that a friend of mine came up with, and she is autistic as well. She's an amazing woman called Sarah Louise Acril. And she said, people come up to her and say, why are you so intense? And she said, well, why don't I turn around and say, why are you so superficial? And she said, well, I wouldn't say that because that would be rude. But people are. So, you know, you can sort of diagnose any, anything. Somebody came up with a few clues for how you diagnose neurotypical people by saying, give vague hints instead of asking directly. Or the need to fit in is more important part of, uh, to, to fit in as part of a pack overrides all else. Um, believes people should be listened to and obeyed simply because of their job title. I mean, some of these things are, are quite weird uh, and, and they're quite fun because I think we have to slightly poke fun at the fact that we are pulled apart for having these extraordinary abilities to be honest, to be direct, to be critical often or to see faults sometimes and point it out. But I want mm -hmm. to talk slightly different again, some of the skills that we have and some of the things we're not so good at. If you look at how people rise through organizations generally. They're quite good at the, the early stages, but in order to develop upwards through the organization, they have to be good at managing people. We have this sort of rather perverse link between leadership and management. In order to be able to direct a business, to lead a business, you need to have vision. You need to be able to have perspective. You need to be able to see things that are going on that aren't apparent to everybody else. Now, we're brilliant at that top bit, 
but we tend to be rubbish at the managing bit in the middle. I'm a good leader and I'm a rubbish manager. So we need to also be recognizing that this is one of the reasons why we don't have the best people leading our organizations is because we've already determined that they need to be good managers in order to promote them. And when we realize they're not good managers, we get rid of them. It's not. Yeah. So it's, there's so much more potential that's there that we're missing out on. I mean, I, I think this raises lots of other issues about empathy and about actual management, you know, where you're not supposed to identify, you're supposed to manage. It's complex to answer, but I want to bring up some other questions that have been raised by the audience. So somebody's asked me, why don't I want to be labelled? Well, I'm going to try and answer that question. So when I did my PhD on shoplifting, my PhD su supervisor, who's Raphael Samuel, is a very eminent in, in historian. He said to me, comrade, comrade, why do you want a PhD? And I said to him, um, Raphael, with my accent, it can only be an advantage. And one of the reasons I don't want to be labelled is because coming from a crime family, you know, who has been subjected to labels that are horrendous, another one is too much for me. And so personally, and I get students who don't want to be labelled, and I'm very supportive. And I, I am thrilled with, actually, the way UAL gives them all sorts of reasons to engage. And like some of my students say to me, I'm only going to do this because they're going to give me a laptop. And they're only going to do this, a lot of them, because they really need to do it. And so there's something actually very important about what UAL does. And so for me, that's something that I want to acknowledge. But I also want to um, raise some of the other questions, which is about practice-based research. And so we're a very new university. And at the moment, we are trying to make our way in the world and develop our PhD students so they're up to scratch. But I would like to see in the future a place where the art speaks for itself without writing. And like the question I'm asked is about writing, like why does it dominate? And the answer is, is because we have yet, we have yet to make the, the case for art for its own sake. And I know that many of the um, executives at St. Charles and Martins and actually the wider college are trying to change the world, you know, to try to try and get this forward. And it's happened in other countries. And that I think that eventually we will get there. But revolution is a slow process. Um, so um, I've got another question here. Um, does anyone else want to answer about the um, PhD question? Does anyone want to respond? I see. So um, the question again is about, is it one in 10 of the population that has dyslexia? And um, what is what are the percentages? Joe, I'm going to ask you to try and answer that question. Yeah, the, I, there's, there isn't, like I said, there isn't a, a, an exact figure because you'd have to test the entire population. And that, that, that's, the, that's what would make it difficult because a lot of people who will mask or who, because when you, if you, when you're looking at the strengths and weaknesses, a lot of a lot of us will will hide. Like I, I hid my difficulties, even though I knew I had difficulties. I was able to navigate for, um, for an undergraduate for years and do a postgraduate without a diagnosis of, of dyslexia and 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 ADHD. So it's because we've got high high IQ, more than likely, we mask it and use our strengths to outweigh our. our our weaknesses so that's why i think it's difficult to get an, a total um proper sort of figure on it it's more like guess guesswork because it's having access to those diagnoses i see someone posted something there as well space. okay so i think that but we're nearly at the end of the session i want to thank the speakers this is um there, there are many people in the um discussion sue house for example is saying great introduction to neurodiversity I'm about to start my PhD at CSM and I'm interested in this area and thank you for sharing your journey. So thank you everybody and for your questions and please join us. I hope you've seen the um, call online and that you might consider helping us go forward. So good night everybody and thank you again. Bye everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.